coming up, the plastic food container is the staple of a kitchen cupboard. We investigate exactly how safe they are to stick in the microwave. Plus, as one of the biggest online retailers launches a major sale today, Rip Off Britain's Angela Rippon examines if we're really getting value for money. And ahead of tonight's BBC documentary, Teens in Care, presenter Joe Swash tells us why he's so keen to follow in the footsteps of his fostering mother. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Morning Live. Gethin is back. It's lovely to see you. It's After nice to be back. Weekend of your wedding weekend, but not your wedding. <laughs> not your wedding. Careful. Not what your wedding. Tell not us all wedding. about it. Oh, yes. I've been in Italy for Dr. Zan's uh, wedding to Dolly. Oh. It was absolutely amazing. So lucky to be there. It was just full of uh, love and joy. I think I took two pictures, which I thought I'd show you. That's one oh, of them. Yes. With oh. the bride herself looking Look. beautiful. And then this is the other one I got of uh, <gasps> Zan just... Is that your wedding? So that's the wedding I was talking <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah, I don't know what go. he's doing. Like, he's just holding me so tight. He's uh, got his oh. hand, his finger in my ear for some reason. <laughs> um, and this is how they arrived Look at, at the ceremony. But you can see there's loads of gravel. I think he underestimated how much gravel there was. And so by the time he got to the top table, he was a right sweaty mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're on the tandem bike now uh, on their honeymoon. They've he's gone on honeymoon on the tandem? I think so, yeah. He's supposed to be back on Monday. So whether he gets back on the tandem bike, I, I don't know. But, yeah, hopefully we'll see Zan next Oh, week. how wonderful. Congratulations to them. Yes, indeed. Uh, right, before we tell you what's coming up on the show today, uh, there's a meeting just after 10am uh, today between banks and building societies and the Treasury Committee. You might have seen Ben on breakfast just talking about this a few minutes ago. Interest rates uh, are now, they've hit a 15-year high. So many people are stressed about falling behind with repayments. And, of course, it's having a huge impact on the housing market too. Uh, you might have loads of questions about this. Morning Live, always here to try and help. There's our email address, morninglive at bbc.co.uk. If you've got any worries or questions, we will look at this uh, over the next few days and weeks, of course, on Morning Live. Absolutely. Please get in touch with us. Now, rip-off Britain's Angela is with us here in the studio. Alongside Dr Ranj, who's opening an eye clinic on the show this morning, Chef Bryony Mae Williams is cooking runner beans three ways with loads of garlic. Very happy about that. And Rhys Stevenson, without the garlic, <laughs> is uh, on Strictly Fitness duty. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. morning. They are all rearing to go. Also coming up, we're giving Manchester's iconic town hall a bit of much-needed TLC. The 150-year-old building has been closed for five years whilst it, whilst it undergoes the biggest restoration of its kind in the UK. So in quarter of an hour, our crafting queen and presenter Jackie Joseph is seeing how the work is going. And we're building up to Strictly Fitness at the end of the show with Reese. So what's on the menu, please, today? Well, people are wearing shorts. Ice cream's never tasted so good. So, of course, we're doing summer <laughs> bangers here for Strictly Fitness. Although it's Britain, so it's more like summer bangers. <laughs> but we are dancing to Ori and Joanne's cha-cha. It's the body roll. There it is. There it is. He really makes, he travels quite a distance, doesn't he, in that? So it's all about the core. Uh, and hopefully we'll get maybe a bit more sun by the time we do it. We'll see. Gotta but uh, we'll bring the sunshine in the studio. Summer bangers, good choose like spells of summer. Summer Spells, <laughs> little droplets <laughs> of <laughs> summer. Yeah, that's <laughs> probably more like it at the moment. Summer? All of that coming up on the show. First, though, millions of Brits will have received an email this morning about Amazon Prime Day, where amazing deals have been offered designed to entice you through their online doors. And, of course, they're not the only retailer who does this. Now, while there are some bargains to be had, sometimes they're not all as they seem, are they, Angela? You're right, Gabby. Um, and that's, I think, because we all love a bargain, don't we? So we look forward to things like Amazon Prime Day, which actually is a misnomer because it's two days, really, because it started last night and it doesn't finish until late tomorrow night. Um, but, you know, we look forward to the January sales, the Christmas sales, the, the summer sales, Black Friday, which we've imported from America. And um, while you can get massive discounts on all of those occasions, actually, the, the truth is that retail prices fluctuate sometimes quite dramatically on certain items throughout the year. And I'm going to tell you in a moment how you can track that. But certainly Amazon Prime Day really does offer some fantastic discounts. And to give you some idea, we, we tracked three of the items that they sold last year. And you can see them here. We've got um, hair straighteners, which retail at £169, which they sold for... 
30% off, that was £111. You got 40% off a vacuum cleaner, which should be £319, but you could buy it for 179 And finally, they're a whopping 50% off a smartwatch, which retails at 89 well, 90 quid. Um, but you could buy it for £42.74. So there are big deals to be to be made out there. Last year's prices. Though, Last year's savings. prices, yeah. that is too. But I think savvy shoppers will know not only that prices do actually fluctuate in the air, but very often, as you're coming up to one of these special sales, very often the retailers will just hike the price just that little bit more to make sure that when they give you 10, 30 or 50 percent off, you're, you are still getting a bargain, but not quite the bargain that you thought you might have had. Now, if that sounds a bit complicated, let me just show you what we mean, because we've tracked the price of a generic toothbrush. Now, this is an electric toothbrush, which actually retails at £220. But you can see back in January, I suppose right about the time of the January sales, you could have actually bought it for £64.99, wow. 65 quid. Yeah. But you see that line, look, it's going up and down. It's going all the way down to £65, and then it's going all the way back up to Whoa. £220. It's like a Manchester skyline, man. It is a bit. <laughs> And then when you look at what's just happened in July, the, there was a time where, what, within four days you could have bought it at the, the lowest price of £65. But at the moment, it's right up at the top there at just a penny less than the recommended retail Inside price. In four days. In four days. That's how the price has gone up and down. So it's not a question of um, buyer beware. It's more buyer be mm. aware that mm -hmm. that's how prices can fluctuate. Yeah. Now, you've got a statement, haven't you, there? I've got a statement, actually, from Amazon because um, they're the ones that we're talking about today. And they do say that they do work to offer customers great value with low prices throughout the, day, the year. But on prime dates, they offer hundreds of thousands of deals from every category across the UK at a time when, as we all know, saving money is so important for its customers. So how can you find out if you're really getting a bargain? Well, those charts that I've just shown you are not just exclusive to us on the telly. In fact, they're available to all consumers. You just have to go online and find a price checker or a price runner. And um, again, let me just give you an example of how this might work. There's a company called Camel, Camel, Camel. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Camel, Camel, Camel. <laughs> and <clears throat> what they do is they track the prices that are for sale on Amazon. And again, you can see, I mean, we've just taken a generic air fryer here, and you can see how the price has fluctuated up and down and up and down right the way throughout the year. And that's important because although they track Amazon prices, prices, then also a lot of other retails track that as well because they don't want to be undersold by Amazon. There's another price tracker that you can go to, which is actually called, it's a price runner. <coughs> Excuse me. And what this does, again, it tracks prices, but it does it for a number of different retailers. So it might be Curry's or Boots or Aldi or whatever. So you can not only see what the price is, but which company actually offers you the very best price. OK. Uh, so when it comes to staying, st staying safe whilst trying to get a bargain online, do you have some top tips yeah. that we can The obvious take away one, shop around, and that last tracker yeah. will give you the obvious way of doing that. You can see who's selling what and at what, is, what price. Don't try to avoid impulse buying yeah. because, again, you know, decide in advance what you might want. Give yourself a couple of weeks beforehand to track those prices to see whether or not the price that you're going to get at the sale really is as good as it appears. Check the reviews. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the fact that some people are paid to write reviews. So go to the manufacturer's own review site. It's a much better one. And beware of hidden costs. Things like postage to take the goods back or to have them sent to you in the first place. They could just take the shine off what you think has been a really, really good price. Very, very quickly, I have to say, your rights as a consumer are protected. If you go into a shop at a sale, they will tell you, sale goods, you can't get your money back if you don't like it. But if you buy online, you've still got the protection of being able to have 14 days cooling off period when you decide whether you want it or not, 14 days in which to tell the, um, the supplier that you're actually going to send the goods back. And um, they've got 14 days in which they can pay you the money. Great Good stuff. advice. Thank you Brilliant. very much indeed. And only buy something if you really need it as mm. well, not just because mm. it's on sale. Now, one thing most of us won't need to buy in the sales of plastic food containers. They're often tucked away in a kitchen drawer and chucked in the freezer or the microwave without a second thought. Yeah, after Morning Live viewer Joyce got in touch to ask how safe and hygienic they are to reuse, we sent cook Bryony Mae Williams to find out and some of the results left her shocked.
particularly useful to microwave, freeze and store food before chucking in the dishwasher to clean and use again. But I have to admit, I do have a little bit of doubt when it comes to my ragtag collection of kitchenware, half of which I can't even remember where it came from. And I find myself thinking, is it okay to put it in the microwave or in the icy cold freezer? I've got old food stain ones, old ones from the takeaway. Are they really all just fine to use as we choose? As many of us try to save money and be more environmentally conscious, I reckon it's something we all could do with knowing more about. Do you use like plastic containers maybe to put your leftovers in and things oh, like course. that? Oh, of course. All the time. I do, yes. Yeah. You've got to keep those leftovers. Do you use like the ones that you get from maybe no. uh, takeaway? Yeah, yeah. Would Do you reuse those? Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Yes, absolutely. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To help provide some answers on safety and sustainability, I'm meeting plastics researcher and marine scientist Stephanie Lavelle. For example, if I've had a takeaway and I've got this tub left over, I'm thinking I'm doing the right thing by reusing it, putting some leftovers in it maybe, you know, putting it in the freezer or putting it in the microwave. How do I know if, if that's safe? A container like this will have mm -hmm. potentially a microwave safe label on it. That means that it can withstand high heat and it's not going to melt or become brittle when you put it in the microwave. But none of these symbols mean that the plastic is safe from leaching additives because this is the, the big issue that we're concerned about. Okay, so this little microwave symbol here doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to leach additives. Chemicals used in plastic have been linked to a range of health issues and studies demonstrate they can leach into what we eat. We call it chemical migration or leaching of additives from the plastic material to our food. Um, and we can kind of see the reverse when we see our food staining the plastic. So it's the additives that are being added to the plastic structure that are sort of transferring from the plastic into the food. Absolutely. There are processes that can um, make this worse. So we know over time additives will leach more. Heat can also increase the rate of chemical migration um, and things like fatty foods, acidic foods, putting hot foods in our containers can also increase that migration. So how do we make sure we're, what we're eating is safe then? You really should only be using plastic with the manufacturer's recommendations on them. There are standards and regulations saying that we should have uh, safe quality food grade plastics if it's going to come into food contact. Those manufacturers' recommendations will be outlined in the instructions that come with new containers, but for older ones there are symbols on the bottom of the tubs themselves to help. The microwave one we already know means it's safe to use in a microwave. This one means dishwasher safe, and this little snowflake means it's freezer friendly. So far, so straightforward, if you know what you're looking for, but some are less obvious the little numbers in the triangles. What does number five mean? So number five means it's made from polypropylene. Uh, this is quite widely used for containers and that's because polypropylene has a very high melting point. It can withstand temperatures up to 160 degrees. There are seven different numbers in triangles. Each relates to the type of plastic used in the product, which can be useful if you want to know if it can be collected in your recycling. But when should you ditch or recycle your containers I bet a lot of us have got ones looking a bit tired. So this is one of mine. You can see here it's gone a bit orangey. So this is where the food has leached into the plastic. Yes. I maybe wouldn't keep using it to store food in because storage time really has been shown to affect the chemical migration into foods. And you could maybe store something else in this one to save throwing it away just yet. I have to admit, there's much more to the humble plastic container than I imagined. My mum, Colleen, is of the generation who first embraced the plastic storage revolution in the heady days of Tupperware parties, which began in 1960. Does she and her friends know any of this? Or, like me, have they never bothered to look? Have you ever noticed the symbols on the bottom of your plastic containers? No, never even turned them over. <laughs> what about you, mum? What do you think this little symbol here means with the triangle around it? I think it means how many times you can safely reuse mm. that container. Good guess, Mum, but wrong. The numbers on the bottom in the triangle, um, they're just the plastic identification code. So those plastic type symbols are nothing to do with food safety. I can see how people get confused. 
I thought this was okay because it's BPA free. Which is good. BPA is known to uh, impact infant development and child development. The manufacturers decided to remove BPA because this is a, a widely known chemical of concern. So even though it's BPA free, it doesn't mean that it won't leach out other chemicals. This one doesn't have any signs on the bottom. Um, so we can't make any inference to what that plastic is. It might not have been tested to be food safe. This little symbol here, what does this mean? The little cup and the fork? Um, so that means that it's uh, food safe. And that one seems key. The little fork and wine glass means you can use it safely for food. So if it's not there, I'd steer clear. But if all this seems too much of a minefield, when all you want to do is save on food wastage, perhaps there's another way. People like me who are trying, you know, we want to help, we want to recycle, we reuse. What do we put our leftovers in? So ideally, ceramic or glass. We're not adding all of these additives for flexibility or rigidity. So we need to try and phase out plastic from our kitchens, from our lives. It's going to be a big transition period for everyone. More is being learnt about plastic and the best way we can use it for us and the environment all the time. But for now, the message I'm taking away is to check the manufacturer's instructions or those little symbols carefully and to recycle those old discoloured ones or just use them to store something else that isn't food. Reusable containers are essential in any kitchen. And after today, I certainly feel more confident that I know how to use and maintain them safely. And next time I get my plastic container out in the kitchen, I'll definitely be taking a closer look. It's like an education now. It's like a new language we're to learn. I had no idea. Yeah, thanks, Bryony. Thank really, you really useful stuff, that. Uh, we are now focusing in on our health. Uh, in the summer months uh, range, um, you get red, itchy, irritated eyes. They become more common. A lot of people might think that's just pollen but you're mm. talking about conjunctivitis yes and it can be pollen which causes a type of conjunctivitis but there are lots of other oh. causes which is what we're going to be talking about today let's firstly be clear on what we're talking about firstly the conjunctiva is a layer that covers the whites of your eyes and the inside of the eyelids and when that becomes inflamed or irritated that is what we call conjunctivitis um, colloquially known as pink eye um, and it's lots of different causes. Firstly, classically, infections, so bacteria or viruses associated with colds. In newborn babies, it can be bugs that are picked up on the way out if they've been delivered vaginally. And non-infective causes, that's the other big group. And this includes things like allergic conjunctivitis or hay fever, irritant conjunctivitis, for instance, if you splash a chemical in the eye and it irritates it, or even as part of a wider condition, so things like certain rheumatoid diseases, a condition called Kawasaki disease, that can also cause a conjunctivitis as well. So what are the symptoms that we should look out for? Classically, four main ones. So firstly, redness of the eye. Um, so the white of your eye becomes red and can look bloodshot. Swollen eyelids and puffy eyes. Um, a discharge from the eyes, which can be watery or thick, can be yellow or green. And finally, that, that horrible, gritty, itchy, sore feeling as well. Yeah. What, what, do, you, what do you do then? Because there's probably a tendency mm. to try and fix it yourself or rub your eyes. What, what are the do's and... Don't yeah. to try and ease the irritation. Oh, the temptation I to bet, rub yeah. your eyes is yeah, you so yes. strong. First and foremost, I can't stress this enough, speak to your pharmacist, because they're brilliant in conditions like this. So other things you can do, keep your eyes clean. So use sterile or cooled, boiled water. And remember, if you use it like a swab to clean each eye, use a separate one for each oh, eye. You don't want to really cross-contaminate. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, cold compresses and flannels can help with the symptoms. Um, they can cool the eye down and, and ease that itchiness and soreness. Thirdly, if you've had inflammatory eye drops, anti-inflammatory eye drops prescribed or antihistamines, that can help if it's an allergic conjunctivitis. But if it's infective, you may be given antibiotics. You might be given an ointment or eye drops. Um, if it's a child, you may actually have to get them prescribed. Otherwise, you can get them over the counter from your pharmacist. Important thing to remember, ointment tends to stay in the eye a bit longer because it's a bit stickier rather than drops, which sometimes just sort of fall out. And the trick is don't stick them right on the cornea of the eye, the iris bit, because that's a sensitive part. Pull down your lower eyelid, clean your hands, pull down your lower eyelid, put it into that little pocket there, drops or ointment, and then just blink and let that spread around. That's the best way to get that medication into your eye. Again, use separate sets of ointment or drops for each eye.
That's really good. OK, so what are the things that you shouldn't The do's doing? and don'ts, yes. So we've got a, a little table, actually, to clarify this. Uh, do's, make sure you pay attention to hygiene. Make sure you keep your eyes clean and cool. You can buy stuff over the counter for that. Avoid the allergen that's causing the issue, if that's the problem. And finally, sunglasses, wraparound sunglasses. We talk about it a lot and things like hay fever that can keep things like pollen out. Don'ts, don't wear contact lenses if you've got conjunctivitis. Try not to rub your eyes, especially because That's that can... That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, that can cross-contaminate. Um, avoid using eye makeup and avoid sharing face products and eye makeup as well because that can spread things around. Uh, if it's not conjunctivitis, could it be something else or what could it be? It can be and there's other things to bear in mind that over, the symptoms overlap with conjunctivitis. Firstly, dry eye conditions like Sjogren's syndrome, which is a particular syndrome um, that causes dry eyes, that has a very specific treatment so speak to a healthcare professional about that. Secondly, glaucoma, certain types of glaucoma um, can lead to redness of the eye, also itching, pain, clouding of the clear part of the front. If that's you and you've got those sort of symptoms, speak to a healthcare professional because that, that needs urgent treatment. And finally, the point I really want to make is if you've got a newborn baby in the first two weeks of life who develops signs of conjunctivitis, please see a healthcare professional because sometimes if they've been delivered vaginally, they can pick up bugs on the way out and they can cause conjunctivitis. Wow. Occasionally it's due, due to the same germs that cause sexually transmitted infections and they can lead to serious eye problems and even blindness if they're not treated properly. So wow. please speak to someone about that. Thanks, Frank. Really, it's really useful stuff. We're talking about Goodness. eyes. I just, how beautiful are his eyes? Have you noticed that? Because we're talking about I've eyes. I've noticed oh, many you times. Charmer. I lost myself. You in just feel bad because, like, you didn't invite me to Zan's wedding and just yeah. plus one. <laughs> Wasn't my job. It's his job. They've been to do going that. on about this all morning. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ranch. That was so interesting. Now, when you're not feeling 100%, having a loving family and a forever home is something many, many people take for granted. However, for thousands of teenagers in care, it can feel like a distant pipe dream. Social care for over 16-year-olds has risen by 37% in the last decade. And former EastEnder, Joe Schwash, has first-hand experience. His mum was a foster carer for 15 years. And in a new BBC documentary tonight, he discovers the hard-hitting reality for young people. What's it been like? I find it really difficult. They were showing me pictures of when they were kids. And Aidan had a couple of toys from when he was a kid. So. It re the, especially the toys, it really got to me in the pictures because like, it's, it was only like a little toy soldier, but he'd kept that. That was his one little thing that... Reminded him of home. Yeah. And I found that really quite emotional to see. <laughs> oh, Joe oh. is with us this morning. Nice to see you, Joe. Hello, everyone. How are you? Doing well. And just, just seeing your, your emotion coming through there in that clip, it's uh, obviously a subject that's close to your heart. Yeah, it's a, it's a subject super close to my heart. You know, my mum's a foster carer and we've had two beautiful children. Um, one, Daniel, who's just gone to university and, you know, we're all so proud of him. So it's something really close to my heart and, you know, seeing these kids so vulnerable, um, yeah, just it, it's just quite overwhelming. Now, you, uh, obviously, there was amazing people that you spoke to in this documentary and um, it, the, the impact on them, especially Carl, you know, amazing stories. Yeah, I mean, each of them have all had, you know, some really tough upbringings, bringing, you know, and, and Carl, we spoke to Carl and, and for myself, I, I could just feel how vulnerable he was and I could really relate to him because, you know, he's, he's a young man and he, he, he's not quite ready to, to enter the big world, but he's sort of being forced into it. And I just wanted to take him home, you know? Yeah. I just wanted, that's what Stacey said. She said, you should just take him all home. I was like, I wish I could. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, I just really wish him all the best, you know? Were, were you quite shocked about the lack of support for um, young people like Aidan, like Carl, like Joe? Oh, Geffen, honestly, I was I was so shocked because, you know, I've been in and around the care system for like 15 years because of my mum, but I didn't really know the ins and outs of it. And when I found out what was going on and I met some of these young people, I, just, I was almost, I felt almost ashamed of myself that I didn't realise this was going on, you know, because as much as these kids are not ours biologically, as a society, we owe it to them 
to give them the best start in life as possible. And it's almost like the forgotten subject. Um, so I'm so pleased that I've got a chance to so shine a light on it and, and get people talking about this subject because something needs to happen really fast. Yeah, well, I mean, you certainly do that by doing a documentary. You raise awareness of the issue, uh, for sure. Uh, you mentioned there that Stacey was saying, bring them home, Joe, you want to do more to help. It, it, is that something you've actually thought about, you know, based on the fact you've seen your, your mum go through it? Is that something you can consider, want to do? Yeah, most definitely, you know. Me and Stacey have been together for, for years. So Stacey's seen, you know, Daniel's progression and and his relationship with my mum and how he's blossomed. And honestly, the, I, couldn't, I couldn't recommend it to anyone enough, you know, the, the feeling you get when you give someone, especially like Daniel, that, that second chance. So if me and Stacey ever get the chance when, when our kids grow up and they, and they fly the nest, if we're physically capable still, we most definitely are going to sit down and discuss fostering ourselves because, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's an important thing to do there are so many kids out there that need to be loved and need a home. Um, and if we can provide it, then that's something me and Stacey are definitely going to do. Mm. Oh, you're a wonderful couple and they'll be very lucky to be fostered by you. <laughs> Joe, thank you very much and our love to Stacey as well. Thank you so much. Oh, you know, well, I'll, I'll thank you so much for letting me come on and talk about this subject and hopefully everyone watches it tonight and as a society, we can, we can make a change. If the government are not going to do it, we can do it, you know. Bless you, Joe. Thank you very much. Now, for details of organisations which offer advice and support with adoption and fostering, go online to bbc.co.uk slash actionline. Yeah, a reminder of the show tonight and Joe Swash, Teens in Care, 9pm, BBC One, and available on iPlayer 2. Big thanks uh, to Joe. And Joe thanks, actually Joe. might have uh, called Albert Square's home for many years on EastEnders, but we actually have an Albert Square up here in Manchester too, which is actually home to the famous town hall that dates back over a century. The historic building has been closed for the last five years as the largest restoration in the country takes place, costing hundreds of millions of pounds. Crafting Queen and presenter Jackie Joseph went to check on the progress and even had a go at recreating an iconic Mancunian... ..from the clock that sits inside the 280-foot tower to the original Venetian mosaic floors. Neil Phillips and his team are responsible for repairing the tiled marble flooring throughout the building. Neil, this is a hive of activity. How much further do you have to go with this restoration? Yeah, it's all going very well. We're about a year left of the project itself. There is over 4,000 square metres of mosaics, which we've been tasked to restore. We've probably got about another 2,000 square metres to get through. For that, a lot of marble has been ordered in and brought to us. So over three tonnes has been brought to site from Italy. Can you imagine that, the work that you and your team are doing? They're going to be seen and admired by all the visitors for at least another 150 years, I'm sure. How, how does that make you feel? It's a privilege to be a part of. When the doors open and we can see in all its glory, then... Because it's filled with a swarm of these stripy stars. The worker bee has been a symbol of the city since at least 1842, when it was incorporated into Manchester City Council's coat of arms. It represents the city's resilience and industriousness. And I'm going to learn how to make one. So what we've done is, wow. using uh, this acetate here, yeah. I was able to lay this over the top of an original worker bee. Yeah. So this template is based tile for tile on the one that is within the floor itself. Mm. So once we've got our design onto the acetate here, then I'm putting a layer of um, carbon paper in between that. Right. So when I draw on this, it's going to transfer to the paper. Yeah. So for instance, if I do a little section of this wing here, when I lift it up, that should have transferred onto the paper itself. Once you have a stencil, a water-based glue is used to stick the marble to the paper. When dry, the bee can then be transferred onto a different surface and fixed using a compatible tile adhesive. Once that's set, the paper can then be removed using water, just like a transferable tattoo. And it's something that's relatively easy to have a go at yourself.
This is an indirect method where we're sticking it to paper, but there's nothing to stop you having a bit of plywood or yeah. a slab at home, yeah. and then you can stick directly onto that. And if you were doing it that way, I'd use any purpose tile adhesive and stick the uh, ceramic, marble, glass directly to it. I feel really lucky that I've seen a small part of this enormous restoration. And when the town hall reopens, it will undoubtedly be a place that Manchester will be so proud of. And I love the fact that I've been able to take a little piece of it home with me. And look, there it is. It looks good, yeah, doesn't it? Doesn't it look good? Yeah, I do love the bee. The symbol of Manchester is fantastic. It's beautiful. Lovely. So much history there. Well, from bees to beans. Runner beans, in fact. They're just coming into season. So whether you've been growing your own or maybe just noticing them in the shops a bit just more. Just noticing them? Yeah, what? just There's a them. bean. There's more of them at this oh, time. Oh, there's another bean. See, I've seen a lot of them this morning around <laughs> the studio because that's what Brani's brought with her. Runner beans, in fact. Um, you're going to do them three ways. Yeah. Which of ways course. are they? We're going for some zesty, garlicky runner beans. We've got a runner bean tortilla and some phyllo parcel sort of samosa style with bacon uh, and runner beans i love it three ways of one ingredient it's the way to do it isn't yeah, it where are you going to start us off with then so we're going to start off well i'm going to start off by showing you how to de-string a runner bean oh. so most of them that you, that you uh, buy in the shop you can get them without the string but if you're growing them at home they will have the string in so a lot of people just Did pull just... them out like gabby's doing but you can actually use a peeler it's a little hack for you so you put it on its side like that and you just literally run the peeler oh down the top I didn't and that know gets this. rid of the string that's, that's bit, so clever. So it's easy, easy isn't it? to take the safety off the peel, or I find. <laughs> yeah. Well, they know what you're like, Gethin. So. Yeah, that's true. They don't trust me with anything around here. Okay. So once oh, you've done clever. that, you're ready clever. to cook with them. It's all right, isn't it? So for this recipe with our garlicky runner beans, I'm going to finish it off here. But to start with, you're going to heat um, a teaspoon of butter in a frying pan. You're going to add your chopped uh, green uh, runner beans, rather not green beans. Um, you're going <laughs> to. Um, and you're going to squeeze over the juice of some lemon and then you're going to fry them up and that's what you have here. Then you're going to take some more butter, heat that up with some chopped garlic, as you can see, that's going on in here. Oh, it smells. It smells good, right? So good. Coming I'm going to pop my... You're coming my, in for a whiff. Just to, I'm just going to hover, go on. <laughs> then I'm going to pop garlic my prepared butter. lemony runner beans in. Oh, hear that sizzle. Mm. What a great noise. And I'm going to pop some lemon zest in as well because the zest just goes really well with the runner beans and the garlic. Then you give it a mix around. Make sure you get your beans all covered in the garlic and the zest. And then normally I'd pop in a bit of parmesan here, but I find out parmesan's not vegetarian. Why? You can get veggie parmesan. Yeah, you can, but a lot of parmesans aren't vegetarian because of something that's called rennet. It, called rennet. Oh, um, so we're going to pop a little bit of feta on ours today. So is that, that quite, it's oh, veggie is that quite friendly. high heat on there, Bryony? No, it's about it's medium. Just, okay, medium you, yeah, okay. yeah, you can. I mean, when you're frying up the, the beans originally, you want it on a bit of a high one. And then that's literally it. Your garlicky, zesty runner beans are... With feta. Done, with a bit of feta. Ooh. So... Do, do, do. There's some for you to try. Okay, try. We'll have a taste that. of this whilst you move yeah, on go to on. dish number go two. On. We are now on our tortilla. So I lived in Spain oh. for a year, studied Spanish at uni and taught it for six years. Oh, yeah. um, bonjour, so I decided... Bonjour, bonjour. bonjour. <laughs> mm. You're really good at languages, Kath. Um <laughs> So I've decided to do a tortilla today with runner beans. Tortilla. Tortilla. So to start off um, in sort of a medium-sized non-stick frying pan, you want to heat a drizzle of olive oil. Then you're going to add the runner beans and fry... Um, for about four to five minutes, you still want them nice and crunchy. And then we're going to add in some grated garlic, some grated uh, ginger and some basil, a bit of salt and pepper, and then give that a good mix up and just fry it off until you've got some lovely smells coming through. Um, next up, you're going to beat your eggs in a bowl, uh, just lightly, just so you're breaking the yolks. And then you're going to add your bean mixture into the eggs, give that a good mix round, and that goes back into your pan. So the pan you want on a relatively high heat um, and you're going to give it a little mix around to make sure all the eggs get cooked. And you leave that for about four, maybe five minutes. Um, so it cooks from the bottom up. But then, of course, you want the top cooked. So what I do for that is I pop it under the grill for two Ooh, minutes. Good tip. So you can see there it's cooked on the bottom, but not on the top. Under the grill, then it comes out looking like that. Doesn't that look fabulous? And you've got Dead. some there to try. So it's really, really quick, really easy, and packed full of goodness. It's is really it a good packed lunch for kids for school? Great packed. Like, do you know what? It tastes nice hot, but I really love it cold. Mm. Mm. So do I. That's good. 
both of these dishes, 10 out of 10 so far. So oh. A lot of pressure going into the samosa. Do you know what? This is my favourite one, though. Oh. I love, I love these. So they're samosa-style phyllo parcels, um, and I just love phyllo pastry. And do you know what? Even Mary Berry, the queen of baking, says don't bother making your own phyllo pastry. Yeah, she just does buy say it from that. The yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she just tell you that? Yeah. yeah. I've heard that a few times, actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, from a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is we're going to boil up some new potatoes just until they're soft enough to mash. So you chop them up into quarters, pop them in a pan with a bit of boiling water. Skin on. Skin on. Lovely. Leave the skin on. It's got the fibre in it. It's got flavour in it. Then you're going to mash them in a bowl. And then after that, you're going to um, heat up the onions. So you're going to dice some onions, heat that up with some bacon lardons. Obviously, if you're veg, you can just leave the lardons out. That's absolutely fine. Um, you're also going to put in your chopped green beans, our runner beans. Um, and then you're going to add that to your mashed potato with a teaspoon of mustard. Give it a good mix round. And that's what you've got in front of you there, Gethin. So that's your filling for the, for the parcels, for the samosas. Right. Now, are you ready for the technical bit? No. No. Well, I'm, I'm really enjoying well, this. I'll have a I can go feel anyway. it already. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop some oil around the edges of each of these phyllo sheets. So this is two phyllo sheets stuck together with a bit of olive oil. You can use melted butter if you want. Um, and then um, you cut it into three, basically. So you want three sort of roughly eight to ten centimetre strips. Then you're going to take some of your filling like this. I feel like the judge. I'm I know. You, yeah, you have to judge who's is better. You step yeah. back, Gabby, and watch the expert. Watching. Pop it in the bottom right-hand corner. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to do the fold, OK? So you ready? This is the technical bit. We're going to fold the bottom right-hand corner over to the left diagonally, like that. And then you're going to fold along the crease at the top. Yours is bursting. This, yeah, and then we're going to fold it over again. Basically, you just keep folding into triangles until... Or you're meant to take the bottom one with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you get it's 10 out of 10. always something. <laughs> oh, well, we've seen oh, you, Oh, well, there we go. At least I got it, hey? And then we're just going to top it with a bit of oil again and some nigella seeds, and then those go in the oven. <laughs> Oh, Gethin, you tried really now, hard. How do they taste? That's the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. We've got some pre-made ones here. Do you want to try one, Gethin? They're all trying them. Yeah, go I'll on. try them. Yeah, go on. So they Lovely. bake for about 20 to 25 minutes until they're golden brown. You've really got to give it, get a good bite to get that filling in. Lovely. And I think they're absolutely delicious. And do you know what? All three of these recipes cost just over a tenner. In total. For a family Super of always. six, all of this. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. You can find all of those recipes on the Morning Live website right now. Now, growing your own fruit and veg and spending time in the garden are great ways to enjoy the summer. However, if you're mowing the lawn or trimming back the hedges, then please, please keep an eye out for some little spiky friends. Yes, hedgehogs are declining in rural areas, but there are some things we can do to help. We look back at when presenter Lindsay Russell went to meet one teenage hero on a quest to help the humble hog. Two years ago, 13-year-old Dylan from Monmouth went to investigate a strange sound coming from the bottom of his garden. What he discovered inspired a whole new curiosity that's kept him out of his bedroom and instead crawling around in the garden, a hedgehog. Since that first discovery, Dylan, now 15, has dedicated his spare time to protecting more of these spiky critters. So, Dylan, you're like this local hedgehog superhero. You just go around saving them. Yeah, most people know me around here. Everyone knows me as the hedgehog person. They, they know to ring me as well. <laughs> they see a hedgehog out in the day and let me know, and they know that I'll do my best to try and help. So, wh why do you think they're so special? Yeah, I think they're, they're amazing, amazing creatures. They play such an important part in the ecosystem, and just generally, a lot of people don't realise that. Decades of urbanisation, building on green spaces and people hacking away at their habitats have seen the European hedgehog added to the red list, indicating their vulnerability to extinction. Numbers have gone from around 30 million in the 1950s to estimated less than 1 million today. Um, so we really need to do something uh, to help protect our hedgehogs. Well, that's where you come in, because you've done some great work, haven't you? Kind of rescuing them and rehoming them. Tell, tell me a bit about that. If a hedgehog is seen out in the day, it normally means it's not OK. So I go and pick up the hedgehog with a rescue box, and then if it requires treatment, just to send it to the local rescue centre that I work with. Grace Johnson from conservation charity Hedgehog Street knows all too well the dangers facing these vulnerable creatures. 
people tend to think of bonfire night because that can be a really dangerous time for hedgehogs but actually as soon as spring comes and people start getting out strimmers and lawn mowers the spines of a hedgehog that are there to protect it just aren't any match for these powerful pieces mm. of equipment so the hedgehog rescues are seeing these awful injuries every single spring and summer at this time of year hundreds of hedgehogs are wounded every month with many of them unable to recover to combat these devastating incidents, Dylan has taken action. Tell me about your recent campaign that you're doing. Yes, I've launched the Hedgehog Aware campaign, which is an aim to try and reduce uh, gardening injuries related to hedgehogs, so from strimmers and lawnmowers. And then I've got some kind of breaking news to share uh, with you, which is that I managed to get Gen Power, um, which is the main uh, UK seller of Hyundai Power products. They've agreed to um, put a sticker which says Be Hedgehog Aware with my uh, website address on it on every piece of the new machinery that comes out of the factory with strimmers and uh, lawnmowers, etc. It's that constant reminder every time before you strim, before you mow, just carefully check the hedgehogs. That is amazing, Dylan. It's so important, the work that you do, and I think that is, it's a credit to you how hard you've worked to, you. to raise awareness. I think I've just spotted one over there. Should we go and have a look? Yes. As we go to investigate, we're careful not to shine the torch directly at the hedgehog. It's important not to get too close because we don't want to scare it, but it's, it's great to like watch from a distance and just, yeah, watch it snuffling about. We're so lucky. I didn't think we'd get to see one. Yeah, we've been really lucky. What Dylan's doing is amazing, and the hedgehogs really need it. We could all be doing more, and I got to see an actual hedgehog. Oh, please oh, be careful. Please be careful. I love little, them. Little lovely creatures, aren't they? Uh, all right, time for Strictly Fitness. Cue the music. Reese Summer Bangers, we're in July, we're feeling intermittent, good. Intermittent, intermittent. We're, we're kind of warm, <laughs> but we're going to dance, we'll be warm after this. Uh, it's a core cool workout looking at Ori and Joanne's Cha Cha Cha. It's the body rolls. You can get, you can try with pretty far with this one. I quite like this. It's very, there we go. There it is. Love it. So, very much using the whole of the body, and it's very simple moves, so do not be worried. The first one now is we're going to do hip isolation. So, it's simple to get your torso to left to the front, to the right, and to the back. So you're just trying to get those isolations going. Ooh. The second one is simple side lead, so just stretch to your side, really feel that. I feel like Jane Fonda doing a, <laughs> one of those classic DVDs. <laughs> you're feeling great, ladies! <laughs> and then finally, it's the body roll. So a simple roll, and step back. How do you do roll, that? And step back. It's kind of like, I feel a bit like an accordion. Just, Kind of lead with your head, lead with your head, you feel like and then follow oh with the rest of the body. Come what are you doing? Let me see it. No, don't ask. All right, fine. Just yeah. carry on. <laughs> it should have you need a wee, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I feel like <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're sitting down, maybe do a simple All right. like this yes. as well. Summer bangers, summer this. bangers. What's Tuesdays? Let's find What's out. The tune? Take it away, Alan. With a full body workout, it's Reese Stevenson. Right. Oh, good, okay. So, get it. That's it, Angela. Over. And now we're going to go for the body roll. Ready? Here we go. And. Roll, and roll, good. Roll, and click, and roll, and good. All right, isolation again, so left, <laughs> feel it, good. Forward, It's like a lack right. of movement, but it's really hard. And back, I know, that's the tough bit about it. And stretch, further around, do it, try it. There it is, Ten and stretch again. Left. Thank goodness, because I'm definitely and need a wing now. Uh, we'll and see roll. you tomorrow, same time, 9.15. Thanks to all our guests, bye for now, have a lovely and day. Roll. And roll.